Well, okay, we finished the fast. 21 days. <clears throat> ended, ended, ended last Sunday, and I uh, hope you've been enjoying pancakes and coffee all week. I have. But you know, in the fast, the whole point is we're believing God when we do this, when we dedicate time to seeking God, we're believing for some miracles. Not in vain. Believing the impossible things will be broken through. Healings. Restoring our family, bringing prodigal people, sons and daughters, moms, dads, people we care about coming back to God. We're believing for miracles. And one of the key phrases, key things, I should say, that we're looking for when we seek God in prayer and fasting is looking for a divine direction. I'm standing here today because of a time of prayer and fasting when God clearly spoke to, to me to start a church in San Diego. And throughout my life journey, there are key turns that became incredible opportunities that were birthed out of dedicated times, concentrated focus of seeking God with prayer and fasting. So as a pastor, you know, I mean, 21 days of fasting, it's a, a bit of a responsibility. I, I, I want to hear what God is saying to our church. I have some things for me. No apology. I mean, I, I want my breakthrough. How about you? I want to hear from God. But, but I want to hear, I want to be God's representative. I, I want to dig deep. But what, God, what are you saying to our church family for 2023? And I feel like God actually gave me a word, a clear word for us for this year. It actually consists of two, two words, two simple words. I'll share it within a second. Uh, but before I do that, I want to kind of shape the picture because God gave me a scripture of the Bible. God, God speaks through the Bible, amen? That's how he talks to us. He speaks through the stories and the verses of the Bible. I was reading this past week because I had not clearly heard. I had a lot of thoughts, but just a couple of days ago, I had a suddenly. God just clearly spoke to me out of a story in the Bible, two specific words, and I'll give them to you in a second. Here's the story. God's people, Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, now became more than a family, more than a clan. Now they're a nation of two to three million people. And for 400 years, their identity as part of the Egyptian culture was slavery. Multiple generation after generation after generation, when they were born, we are Slaves, indentured slaves. They worked feverishly with really little return. And they were tired of it. They were crying out. They were asking God, the God of their fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, what about the promises? The Bible says in the first part of the book of Exodus, God heard their cry, the groaning. God, what about what our father said? It's been generation after generation. We're just locked up in bondage. God heard their cry, and he sent them a deliverer, and his name was? Moses. Moses. He goes into Egypt and has the big dialogue with Pharaoh, all the ten plagues, and finally Pharaoh let the people go. So now we're picking up the story. The nation of Israel walked out of town, packed up their stuff, and walked towards the promised land. A few days journey, it's interesting, God gave them very specific instructions on where to camp. He named this hill, this little community, named this, whatever. Have the people camp here. Now, it's unique because in front of where they camped was the Red Sea. How are you going to get through that? On either side was a mountain range. How are you going to get through that? They're kind of hemmed in. And behind them, oh, that's how they just came into town. And they're settled there. And then another part of the story is Pharaoh regrets his decision. We let these slave people go. We can't live without them. Are we crazy? Let's go back and get them. Got his army, his chariots and horses, and feverishly ran out. And suddenly, Israel's Red Sea mountain ranges. Now, the full closure, they're completely hemmed in. They look behind them in a cloud of dust. And here's Pharaoh and his army. In that context, there's three different things spoken. The people speak, 
on how they feel. Moses, the leader, speaks. And then the big deal, God himself speaks about what they were supposed to do in response to being hemmed in with no way out. See, God brought them there with a purpose. A lot of times you and I misunderstand problems. Sometimes God brought us there for a purpose. And for them, if you were to look at this, God, don't you, hey, why don't you give them some? They've been in Egypt for 400 years. Get it. I got a plan. I got a plan. So let's read the three responses. And from those, we're going to find this word that God has for our church. Their story is speaking into our story for 2023. So first, let's look at the people. Uh, Exodus chapter 14, and it says uh, in verse 10, Pharaoh approached, and as he approached, the people of Israel looked up and they panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here? to die in this wilderness. Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have, we, what have you done to us? Why'd you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you? In all this negotiation with Pharaoh, didn't we tell you this would happen when we were still in Egypt? We said to you, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than maybe, maybe we might die in this wilderness. That's what came out of their mouth when they realized they're hemmed in and no way out. Now, what does Moses say? The very next verse. Then Moses said to the people, he says, don't be afraid. Here's one of the, the significant statements. Just Stand still. Don't move. He said, stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians that you see today, you're never going to see them again. He's sensing something. He's not sure exactly what judgment call to make. He's sensing from God. God had kind of told him, I'm going to so deal with the Egyptians, they will never be a problem to my people again. So Moses is kind of, hey, be still. God's going to rescue you. You'll never see the Egyptians today. Then, then he says that the Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm, which other translations are very specific. It means stop talking. Be quiet. Because most of our problems are accelerated because of how we talk. They weren't speaking in faith. Why did you do this? We, I would rather. Can you imagine when you are enslaved to a horrible habit or bondage and addiction and you say, I'd just rather be in there. That's what they were saying. And, 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 and wow. So he's just saying, be still, don't move and be quiet. Be still, but don't talk. You got this? Be still, don't move, don't talk. So that's the people speaking. Moses speaking, but what's God have to say? The next, very next verse. Then God said, I know, okay, what are you going to say? And he said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people, get moving. Yeah. I know you had good intentions, Moses, to try to get, tell them to be still. Don't be still. Get moving. In fact, I love this translation, good new translation. Tell the people to move forward. Shout out with me, move forward, would you? Forward. Say it louder. Move forward. That is the two-word message from God to our church for 2023. Because really, around the world, globally, we, we've been shut down. We've been trapped. We've been stuck. Our economies are tanking. Relationships are weird. There's conflicts and disturbances in every venue of life. Uh, there's divisiveness sickness, COVID, do I need to, we don't, we've repeated this list for three years now. Yeah, I'm tired of the list. And I feel God saying, he doesn't want us to keep talking about how bad it was. Yeah, He's wanting us to pick up, not knowing what the answer is yet, but just say, move forward. Are you hearing this? 
So I want you to see it again, the three, the three points. Put up the three. The people speak. Why, why, why? What's going on? Better to be a slave. Moses says, be still. Be quiet. God says, no, get noisy and get moving. And, 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 and here's the thing. I said it to you before. God led him to that specific describe. If you read it, it's interesting. He said, camp here by this and by this. I mean, he gave, this is where you camp. And, and it caused them to be hemmed in and stuck and vulnerable to enemies. But he did that. God did it, not Moses. God did that to teach his people that if they would hear him, that moving forward would bring closure to their past. Let that sink in for a second. We've all got this past, and your past is anything before this morning. <laughs> past. We've got the last few years have been weird. And we all try to live above it, but it's just there. It knocks on our door all the time. And it sings a song to us, and it's not a pleasant sound. It's a melody that's depressing, and it, it leaves us in a sense of weakness and sickness and setback, and how will this, and what about that? And, 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 and God is saying, I, I, okay, listen, I'm with you. It's time. It's time to pick up your tent. It's time to move forward. It's time to say goodbye to the past. You don't own me any longer. And I'll tell you the way we're going to do this. That's why it was so important that Moses did tell them, be quiet. Because negativity is really our greatest enemy. In fact, I feel, I felt this phrase, that I'm writing these, I'm reading myself here. I just, these, so many thoughts on this. It's just, it's just, um, we, 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 to move forward into what God has for us. The whole point of moving forward is not just going on a stroll. This is going into, he wanted them to move forward into the promised land. I'm taking you somewhere, someplace really good, abundant and powerful, freedom from your enemies and great supply of wealth and you'll be a great nation. You just move forward to go where I want you to go. But we've got to deal with this negativity thing. It keeps coming back and biting us. It keeps coming back and poisoning us because negativity and believing the lies from hell, from our enemy, the intimidation of our Pharaoh and the Egyptian army, the intimidation will shut us down down. So we've got to cut the life source to the negativity. Negativity grows or diminishes based on how much we feed it. And I'll tell you how we feed negativity, by how we talk. And so if we're going to move forward, we've got to make an, a decision. I'm leaving the past. I'm going to stop talking about how bad it's been, who's in the political office, and how bad they come. I'm saying God is for me. I'm moving forward, and I see amazing things ahead. I see breakthroughs. I see the healing we've been believing for. I see God doing amazing things, but we've got to stop the negativity. So if you, for yourself, if you choose, it's, a cho it's always a choice. God never forces anybody. If you choose to hear this Short little message today. Move forward. If you choose to move forward, what's it going to look like? You're going to bring closure to your past. And you're going to walk into the opportunity of the future that God has for you. This is not tiddly. This, this is not playing a, a magic wand. This, this is God's plan. We follow his word and we walk into divine opportunity. When God speaks, our ears are open. And I'm telling you, I, 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 as simple as that may sound, move forward. I believe it is a declaration from heaven to this church family that we are to dig into what that means and walk together moving forward in God, leaving the negativity and the past behind. It's time to move forward. Some, touch your neighbor and say, it's time to move forward. It's time to move forward. It's time to move forward. So I'm going to take some time, and I'm, I'm going to kind of unpack this. I'm going to give you five ways... I felt our team, our executive teams added to this five things that we feel God is saying, uh, what it means, what it looks like to move forward in 2023. Now, maybe you got an email yesterday from a church saying that I was going to 
make a uh, historic announcement. Anybody get that email? Yeah, all right. So I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make that announcement right now. So the first way, the number one way that we're gonna move forward in 2023 is by changing the name of our church. <laughs> okay, you, 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 yeah. yeah. What, 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 what do I mean? Uh, well, I mean, let me take you on a journey with me. I want you to feel this. Uh, 25 years ago, Tammy and I and our three young sons landed in San Diego. We bought a house in the very first subdivision of Forest Ranch. As a matter of fact, there was no Forest Ranch other than our subdivision. There were no shops. There's no Del Sur. There's no nothing. No road to the coast. So when you came through here, this was kind of the dead end. So we bought a house there. And we moved here. We had no church. We had no place to meet. We had nothing but God telling us to come to San Diego. So it was the first Sunday 25 years ago. We just moved here. And we got to go to church. It's Sunday. So we decided we'll go to that big one, Maranatha down the street. I'd met the pastor. I'd come into town a few months early and met a few pastors and let them know that I was coming here to start a church and ask if they'd pray for me. And I gave them a gift, kind of a little connection moment. And Pastor Ray Bentley really graciously received me, and it was a really beginning of a friendship. So anyway, that Sunday, we got to go to church. So we went to church in Maranatha. It was great. We loved it. We worshiped. We heard the word of God. We're pretty happy. Going to get in the car, I felt something in my spirit, a heaviness. I, I couldn't, just so, a grieving, like something, something going on. And I just tried to shake it off and got my family in the car. We got to go eat. And so we drove over to Carmel Mountain Ranch area because that's the only place there was to eat. So, so we, we go there to get some lunch and I lean over and said, honey, you're going to have to go in there with the boys. I don't know what's going on. I need some time with God. I'm fighting. Something's going on big. I don't know what it is. I, don't, I haven't felt like this in ages. What is this? So I let them go, and I drove on Carmel Mountain Road. And I, it, I, don't, I don't know the city. It winds around, and finally in Rancho Pinasquitas, it comes to a dead end. And I mean a dead end. There were, you know, blockades, stanchion things that were put there for construction, and a big mound of dirt maybe 20, 30 feet high, 40 feet high. And it was the literal finishing point in San Diego for the street called Carmel Mountain Road. So I got out, and I felt compelled, so I climbed up this hill. And as soon as I did, that thing left. The heaviness dropped. And I look as far as I could see in every direction, and it was typical Southern California, just low little plants that didn't have a lot of life on them and uh, dirt and warm, and, and immediately God spoke to me because a couple of months before that, I was, before we left Seattle, someone was praying over me because they knew I was leaving to come here, and they had a prophetic word for me that I was going to be like an Abraham. When Abraham, God spoke to him, come out, and I want you to look, Abraham, whatever you see, I'm going to give to you. And I remembered that word while I'm standing there, and it looked kind of like what maybe Abraham saw, just vast land open. And I felt something in me saying, this is going to be a fruitful place. And I just, I started weeping. I, I didn't know what it was. I thought maybe we're going to build a building here. Or what's this land for? And I'm, my mind's having fun. I, what, wow, this is what, God's doing something here. So I came back there every day for 90 days. And I would pour out oil on the land by myself. And I'd pray for five minutes or I'd pray for an hour. I just, it was my thing. And when I had guests come into town during that, had three or four different, you know, leaders that had believed us come in and to check up on us because we're starting this brand new church. And, and we would go there. You got to come. I got to show you something. I got to show you something. And we go there. God would touch them there. We drove a stake in the ground, a bunch of apostolic guys, you know, churches of thousands here with our church of five. And they're here driving a stake in the ground. We're going to take this. Well, 25 years have gone by. We didn't take nothing. Homie, what happened? What was God doing here? I don't understand it. And through the years, we go back to that property. I called the owner. I got his name, and uh, it was owned by a family trust. I tried to get him to sell me. I can't do it. It's a bigger plan. It's worth a bazillion dollars. And, you know, if you own an oak tree in San Diego, you're a multimillionaire. I mean, it did, gosh. I mean, so, so, so I tried to negotiate. Nothing happens. So what do you do with that? End of Mount Carmel. By the way, the word... Carmel's in the Bible a lot. And it literally means 
If you look at the Hebrew, it means fruitful field or fruitful garden or just generically fruitfulness. So God was obviously birthing something in my heart bigger than real estate. He was speaking to me that he wanted to do something that was going to bear a lot of fruit. And so did we miss it by not getting that property? I, I don't think so. If it comes available, we'll go get it tomorrow. But the point is there's something about that experience and about what God was speaking prophetically to our church. So what's the name of the new church? What's the new name for this church? You better stay. What is the name? The name, the new name, which we'll, we'll start today. Where this is the first time this has been announced publicly. The new name for this church family is Carmel Church. I love it. I believe, it's, I, believe it's, I believe it's prophetic. It's not cute. We're not trying to have, have it, there's no motivation other than I know it's God. In fact, I was talking to our executive team this week about this message and trying to shape what we wanted to say to you and God speaking, move forward. And someone said, well, what about if we talk about changing the name again? We've been talking about it for years. And suddenly when they said that, it was like a, a fire went through my soul. Yes. And I'm used to the guy hesitant. Yes, this is the time. And Tammy reminded me that two months ago, we were at a uh, pastor's gathering in Northern California, and there were some men and women that were prophetic praying over the pastor. Tammy and I went forward, and this couple were praying and speaking prophetically over us, and she played it for us two days ago, yeah. and it said, I see a name change. There's a name change coming. God's going to give a name change. I'd forgotten all this. I'd forgotten 25 years. And suddenly this week, God says, you got your plans. I got my plans. It's time to move forward. And you should tell the church, you are a Carmel. You are extremely fruitful. You're going to see more fruit than you ever dreamed you're going to see. Because the name often indicates the purpose. I mean, when God would change people's names in the Bible, there was always strategy, always purpose involved. It's a prophetic word. It speaks to what is yet to come. If we're called City Church, well, we came, we came here with that name because we were in the same name of a church in Seattle. We wanted to keep it. We love it. We want to come here and be a blessing to the city. Our name was our heart. We want to be a blessing to the community. And we've done that in a great way. God's helped us. And we're not going to stop doing that. But that little seed 25 years ago is now becoming something. It's now, we are Carmel. Right. I love it. Now, it's going to take, you know, maybe a year or so before all this is ironed out perfectly. But as of today, we are a new church. I love this. Man, not, not a new church. Not, 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 not a new church. Same church. Same church. Not a new name. Isaiah 62, you will be called by a new name, a name given by the Lord himself. This is not what, try, it, it, it's a God idea, trust me. So what are we doing? We're moving forward by changing the name of our church. Somebody say that's good. But that flows, if, it's, if it means fruitful, then let's get some fruit. The very second reason we're moving forward is to reach more people, fruitfulness. Reach more people. Reach more people. I'm going to give you some thoughts on that. First of all, we're going to work together this year to see a 1,000 people in attendance on a Sunday. Didn't make that number up. I felt God put it in my heart, I don't know, eight, nine months ago. I really, God, what is your vision? What, what, what's the next benchmark? We were almost at 1,000 before COVID, and we're digging our way back, not for numbers' sake, for people' sake. But when you have a vision and you have a number that God spoke and you, it's like you, you, you're going to move towards that. And so how are we going to do that? And I'm asking you to join me in these three ways. We're going to pray that a thousand people make their way. We're going to invite the people that we know and meet. And then when they come, we're going to really make them feel welcome. We're going to love people like we do well. I think City Church San Diego, Carmel Church San Diego <laughs> is a really welcoming, loving church. People are going to be swept off their feet when they walk on the door. I see you guys competing with each other, and who's going to get to shake hand with that person next? Can we do this? Yes. Can we do this? Yes. We're going to reach 1,000 people. It's going to be awesome. Let's look, let's look on. So other, other ways, uh, we're going to increase our school clubs outreach. Yes. <clears throat> Some of you didn't know we had an outreach in the schools. 
probably for over 20 years now, we have gone into local high schools and middle schools with some of our leaders we've trained. And they work with the students in those schools. And we have clubs, Bible clubs. And we've seen so many, hundreds of young people come to Jesus. Many of them have come here and become part of our church. And, um, and you know, it goes in ebbs and flows where we are more successful and sometimes we're not. You know, it's based on finances, if we have leaders, and if we have open doors from the schools. And by the way, generally speaking, it's been a little interesting you know, the schools have their reasons, the principals and some teachers were like, no, you can't come, or you can come for five minutes here. It was pretty restricted until now. About two weeks ago, the school uh, superintendents and principals had a meeting right here in the area, and they invited um, the leaders of the faith community, pastors, to come. And Pastor Gabby on our staff has been involved with, the, with our school club outreach for years. So she went there representing us. And here's the bottom line. They were not like, maybe you can, they were like, the door, they used to be, we took out the door, we removed the wall. Would you just run in here? We can't take, we got to have help. I mean, it was, it, was, it was a heart cry of humility on their part, which I really, I, don't you appreciate people who are successful but humble? These are educated, brilliant people that really add to our community. We love them. We're proud of the men and women who serve in our local schools. But then they were humble. They are saying, we don't know what to do. Our, our, our counseling staff is maxed out and exhausted. We find students sitting on the floor and they can't even talk. They just look at you. What's going on? They can't complete their work. They're all isolated. They're depressed, most of them. They don't even have friends anymore. We have to try to encourage them to come to social events. I mean, and they went on and on. It, it one after another, after another, after another. And bottom line, they were basically saying, please, leaders of the faith community, could you please help us? We don't know what to do. It reminded me of a story in the Bible. And I think it fits us like a shoe. You know, we're, as a church, we're fasting. We're asking God for direction. Are you tracking with me? God, show us what the track is for us to run on. We had our idea. We got all kinds of ideas. But God now has specifically directed us. Let me read this. Saul, 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 the apostle Saul and his traveling companion Silas were bouncing around nation to nation, city to city, preaching Jesus, starting churches. But look at this dialogue in Acts 16. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north to, for the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. Well, so instead, they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there in this vision, pleading with him, come over, help us. So, he puts it in the, in the Context. So we decided, based on this, we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, concluding that God was calling us to preach the good news there. I think that's an amazing story because it fits where we are. We're looking for direction. We're trying to go these different ways. And suddenly, after the fast, God gives us a Macedonian call right here in our backyard saying, come and help us. That's great news because you and I get to pay for it. It's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars. I remember 10 years ago, we were really pushing forward. God told us to really go after the students in the schools again. And a businessman came up and said, I just sold a business and this and this and that happened. Here's a check. I want to sow. See, you helped my son. I came to the church because you helped my son at a club in the school. Here's $50,000. So I already know some of you are holding those kind of checks in your hand. Because vision, moving forward, is thrilling, it leads to miracles, but it's going to cost us something. Are you still with me? So, so, so what are we going to do to reach people? One of them is we're going to spend tens of thousands of dollars this 
year. We're going to sow seed into our community, into those principles. We're going to wash their feet, so to speak, as it says in the Bible. We're going to serve them, serve their staff. We're going to meet those students, and you watch what God will do as we move forward with his direction. It's going to be powerful. There'll be people sitting here next year. There'll be people sitting here next year who do not know God today because we're deciding to move forward with a Macedonian call. Help us, and we're going to do it. Yeah. A couple of practical things we're going to do to reach people. We're going to upgrade our building. I mean, this is a warehouse for heaven's sakes. But God gave it to us, and it works well. And we need to up, we were going to spend a million dollars on it. We were going to come to you with a capital campaign this year. And we just felt God say, don't do that. We are going to make some upgrades, but less money on the building, more money on the people. And that's the plan. So so we are going to upgrade the building. It's going to cost. We're going to do some stuff in our children's area. It needs it desperately. We need to, we don't have a lobby in case you didn't know. And so we're going to kind of create an outdoor lobby area, some things we have to do. It will cost some money, but it's not going to cost a million dollars. So we ought to be really happy about that. We're also going to increase our staff. We need some strategic hiring to take place to do what God has called us to do. We're going to continue spending money on advertising. It's working. Anybody see our signs all over the place? They're awesome. They're really working. We're going to continue to have conferences and guest speakers like we had the last two weeks, the two prophetic weekends. Anybody enjoy that? Was that amazing? So all of these things, they stir us up. They make us evangelists and get us excited about reaching people. We're going to do everything God tells us to do this year moving forward. It might look a little different than it has in the past. We're moving forward to reach people. All right, let's look at the third one. We're going to move forward also in missions, missions and outreach. We, we support uh, a few families uh, in different nations, and most of them have never even been here. It's usually a financial issue. It's a pretty big deal to bring husband, wife, kids from, you know, South America. Uh, but, but we just feel like it's time to do more, make more connection to those nations, bring those families right here. You meet them, they meet you, pour into them, love them, pray over them, give them gifts. We want to send teams on their soil. Some of you have never even dreamed of doing that, and God's going to put it in your heart. We're going to advertise, and you're going to sign up and spend a couple grand, and you're going to go to South America, or you're going to go to Mexico, or you're going to go to Dominican Republic public or places where we are, and you're going to give a week of your time instead of a vacation, you're going to go there and sow your life into another nation that's going to change you forever. We're going to have a greater missions focus with our internship program. It's going to be very missions oriented. And for myself, it's time for me. I want to go back to Mexico. For a long time, I would go there on a monthly basis and teach and preach to about 60 or 70 pastors of churches in Tijuana area. I feel God telling me to start doing it again and go back and pour into that region right in our backyard. It's time to go for the nations because Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples in the nations. And that's going forward. Well, why don't we just take care of us? We got to take care of us and take care of them too. We got to get outside of who we are for a little while and go on the foreign soil and give our lives away. Part of the moving forward is to fulfill the Great Commission and go to the nation God leads us to. I love that. Say say amen with you, would you? Number four, I got two more, two more. Number Number four, move forward into miracles. Now that's the exciting one for you, isn't it? Move forward into miracles. Something's happening. I've been talking to pastors. I have a pastor friend in Northern California who just had a conference, and um, they, they've, been, they've been praying and fasting like we have, and they've been believing for miracles. They had over 200 recorded miracles last week. I talked to another friend, Pastor Ken Wild, who was in our church back in November. I was telling him that we were changing our name today because he's been an advisor. There's about two or three guys that give us advice for the last 25 years. He's one of my best friends who I lean into. Everybody needs to have an advisor, someone speaking in their life. So Ken Wilde is one of those guys for me. I called him yesterday telling him that we're changing our name and God had spoken to me about move forward. And he said, Jerry, you're on it. I mean, you need to preach that because I'm telling you, everywhere I talk to pastors, God is doing something. It's like there's the Holy the wind. Here's how he described it. The wind of the Holy Spirit is blowing. And anybody who's willing to put up their sail and catch that wind is going to go places where there's going to be miracles. He said, he said, he said, he said, he said, he said, you tell them I said this. 
Tell them that Ken Wilde said to, the, to, sit up to Carmel Church. Ken Wilde said to Carmel Church, tell the people, if you want to get the miracle, put your wind, your sail up and catch the wind of the Spirit and He will take you as you move forward, take you into the miracle opportunity. Man, we need more miracles. We need more touch of God, things we can never do in our own strength. Jesus said, there's some things you're going to face that will never change without prayer and fasting. So the miracle, we're going to continue the spirit of prayer in our church. We're going to continue to seek God with fasting. We just completed 21 days of fasting for the first of the year. From now on, here's our new grid for fasting. 21 days in January, three days right before Easter, which we'll do this year. Three more days in the fall as we finish off the year. That's the new grid. We're going to build a much greater, stronger spirit of prayer in the church. This, that, that's the most exciting part of the day. We're going to be a people of prayer. We're going to be a house of prayer for all nations. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to keep talking about it. Just hang on. Fasten your seatbelt and get settled in your recliner. We're going to keep talking about prayer until we just dig deep in it. I see rivers of intercessory prayer breaking up everywhere. I see interruption taking place for all of our lives in our normal everyday life. We're going to be awakened to a new level of groaning, travail, and prayer, and God's going to hear us, and we're going to walk in an unprecedented number of outbreaks and miracles. They're coming. The miracles are coming. And even some fun ones, even some cool ones. A uh, we, we, couple, couple of kind of financial type miracles that happen in our church. We had someone donate a car to our church to be given away. And today, we are giving this car, you want to know who it's going to? To Scott and Flora. Would you guys stand up? Come on, we love this couple. They are amazing. They are amazing. That's a good looking car. Now, this has happened a few times, but someone's called this. We know him. We wanted to bless them. It's a longer story. They deserve, they, they deserve whatever. I mean, they're amazing. They're pure gold. In fact, Flora, Flora came into the church through the campus ministry. Right there. Right there. I just remembered that. That is some of the fruit. So it works. But God bless you guys. Financial miracles, car miracles, and I have in my hand a check for Joe and Simone. Joe and Simone. <laughs> Joe and Simone, they've, they've been in the church longer than anybody. They came to our church maybe three months after we started. And they've been here with us for nearly 25 years. They are some of the most integrous gifted, kind, humble. I would, I would say to you, follow them and your life will be blessed in every possible way. They have a totally unjust, ridiculous thing going on in their lives. It's cost them so much. And some business folks came together, including Tammy and I. We, made some, we put our monies together. This is not from the general fund. This is gifts from people who care. And Joe, I have a check for $10,000 for you. <laughs> we love you so much. Yeah. We believe in you so much. And that problem's going to be solved. That answer's going to come. Come on, this is good news. This is how it works. I love it. I won't go into the details, but trust me, um, and that won't even come close to covering all that you need, but we're your family. And what you deal with, we deal with. You're a righteous man, Joe. You need to know that. You did nothing. It's a weird, crazy, ridiculous accusation. And we all know that. We're with you 100%. In fact, if you, wanna, if you wanted to give towards this for Joe and Simone, they're leaving to take care of the situation in about a week. And uh, if you'd like to give, it, it, would, it would be seed well sown. You can give it to them personally, or I don't know if we could put on the screen. What is it, info? Yeah. You, you can email info at thecitysd.org. Info, I-N-F-O, at the org. If you'd like to help out, I'd like to see that money double. They're worth 100 times that amount. Oh, wow. Miracles are coming. 
We're going to move forward. We're not going to stay where we are. We're not going to be shut in. We're not going to be stuck. I hear that word stuck. We're not going to be stuck. We're going to see amazing things change. God says move forward. And, you know, I, I don't know what all that means yet. I, all I know is I'm doing what he told me to do. I don't know exactly all that that means, but we're moving forward. And the miracles are coming. And number five, this is, a, this is where it all happens. Well, not all. This is where a lot of it happened. Number five on how do we move forward. Move forward in a giving campaign. And if you'll, you'll find on the floor under your chair, you'll find this card. If you grab it real quick, on one side it actually has the five points that I just gave to you. Move forward by changing the name of our church. Move forward to reach more people. Move forward in missions and outreach. Move forward into miracles. And now move forward by giving towards the $500,000 goal. We were going to do a capital campaign. Our leadership team and elders felt we should have raised money for certain things, mainly the building. We were going to go after a million dollars. I felt God say half that. Don't put a heavy burden on people. And, and the half million will go towards all these things. A little bit, toward, some towards the building, yes. But all these people-focused things. Missions and outreach. And, and um, let, me, let me just read the scripture on the front here. Could At the bottom of number five, this is a story of the same people, the children of Israel. And they went through the Red Sea, and they watched the Egyptian army die. And they went through, the prom, through towards the promised land. Somewhere on that journey, God told Moses to talk to the people. He said, take up from them an offering and use that to build the tabernacle. Or you could say their church, for that matter, if you put it in our language, to build the church, the tabernacle. And so he, here, here's what he said. Let me just read it. Exodus 35. So the whole community, all the people of Israel, left Moses after he talked about this giving and they returned to their tents. All whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved came and brought their sacred offerings to the Lord. They brought all the materials needed for the tabernacle. Both men and women came, all whose hearts were willing. They brought to the Lord their offerings of gold, brooches, earrings, rings from their fingers, and necklaces. They presented gold objects of every kind as a special offering to the Lord. So the people of Israel, people of Carmel Church, every man, every woman, who was eager to help in moving forward in the work of the Lord, the Lord that had given them through Moses, they brought their gifts and gave them freely to the Lord. So uh, I, I boldly ask you, not hesitantly, churches do capital campaigns. Has anybody ever been a part of a church giving capital campaign? Yeah, it's just, just life. You know, you want to grow it. You want to get a new building or you want to do some new ministry. We were going that direction, but God put a little change. And we're lessening the burden, not going after the million. I was thinking about the number, 500,000, just two days ago, kind of putting this information together prayerfully, prayerfully. And I thought, 500,000, Lord, what would people do? And, and then suddenly I got this thought, well, that's only... It's only uh, 50 people giving $10,000. And then I felt the Lord say, will you do that, Jerry? I said, yeah, Tammy and I will do that. We'll, we'll lead the we'll, I don't know where we get it yet, but yeah, we'll do that. We'll, we'll give $10,000. And so um, I just, I, I don't know where you're at. I, yeah, we put a range there because it's nice to see it and let your mind and your spirit and your heart all kind of get in agreement. You know, what would... What would God ask us to do as a family, individually, in this year of moving forward? It is part of the deal. Moving forward, even with finances, is part of how we do the kingdom. We just follow what God asks us to do. So this morning, before the first service, I went ahead and I made the pledge for Tammy and I to lead the way. First pledge is ours for $10,000 by the end of the year. So at the bottom of the car, there's a place where you can make the pledge and another QR code where you can actually give. We're asking if you'd be willing to prayerfully consider making a pledge by March 5th so that we can start to map out what we think is coming in and start, you know, getting tickets for missionaries and school campuses, all those things we want to do so we know where we are. And then you can give any time you want in that, in that time. Uh, you can give now. You can make a pledge. You can donate non-cash items. I mean, maybe six, 
seven years ago, Gabe, when we bought this building, I don't remember what it was, we had a capital campaign that I forget what we were raising. And Tammy and I wanted to give bigger than what our finances could do. So we scraped up the money we have here and there. I sold my motorcycle, I think for $8,000 and gave that. Tammy sold a nice purse someone had given her. I had a couple thousand bucks to it. I mean, sell more of those, would you? And so uh, that was supposed to be funny. And, and so we started finding ways to do non-cash things as well as cash. Uh, I'm not saying you should do this. We had just refinanced our house. We had plans, so we took, I won't give you the amount, but a part of that. And we just, suddenly we got these ideas and wanted to lead the way sacrificially because we wanted to have this church. We wanted to see hundreds of people touched. We wanted to see Jesus glorified. We wanted to see the preaching of the good news go out further, better, stronger, and further. So it was, it was, it was costly. I felt the pain, but we're, we're okay. We made it. We, 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 we're, we're not, we, we have food, we have clothes, we have a retirement. Hey, hey, hey. when you put it in perspective, it's, it's seek first the kingdom. It's moving forward has a price tag. So I don't know if there's uh, 50 people that could join us for 10,000. Um, usually when this happens, someone feels God tug on them and their, their numbers are bigger and they give 100,000 or the 50. I'm not playing with you. I'm just trying to sow some faith in you. The, 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 here's the key on this moment. Here's the key. Don't, no, don't get sad on me because we're talking money. How cool is this? How cool is this that we get to bankroll God's plan? How cool we get to participate in what God wants? Are you kidding me? Sign me up. Oh, I just I don't regret selling my motorcycle. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's not like remorse. I still got my wife. She's better than a motorcycle. And I got grandkids. They are a whole lot better than a motorcycle. I mean, but maybe there's some, something God would put on your heart through your business or something to give or sell real estate or jewelry or stock. I didn't finish my statement. The most important thing is just to hear what he says. It just, and it, it could be for someone here with limited, it could be $50, but it could be 100000 It's not the amount. It's the obedience. Hearing him speak and walking in it. Because if we move forward with some, most of the things we're talking about are, are kind of giving things. We're, we're you know, while you're, you're telling me to move forward and praying more. Tell me move forward by getting more people. Tell me move forward, but give my money. What am I getting? You're going to get outrageous blessing because God never is a debtor to no man. You put him first. Oh man, you're setting yourself up for something grand and powerful.